Whenever you're ready. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to my channel. I'm Alex, and today we're going to be talking about what's in my camera bag. What's in your camera bag? Lots of things. Things like? Cameras. And? Other camera accessories. <laughs> you have any lenses? I have some really heavy camera equipment. Oh, it's heavy? <laughs> yeah, it's heavy. Oh, good to know. Any tripods? Any? any... Oh, there's a tripod. Only no, there's one? two tripods. Oh, there's two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But one's currently being used, so. Where is that? There's one tripod. Oh, okay. Only. So, go grab the camera bag. We'll put it on the table and we'll get started. No, I thought you were bringing it. No, I thought you had the camera bag. I didn't have the camera bag. You don't have the camera bag? No. Nope. Well, this video is not going to go well. One second, please. Okay, so the good news is we found the bag. The bad news is we lost Sophia, but I guess that is the sacrifice we have to make to make this video. And this is a good place to start, the bag. So I got a couple key things to talk about that are really important about this bag that many people might be wondering, which is like travel size, weight, is this what I carry all the time? You know, is this what I use in the car? I'm gonna explain that. So first things first, this is the Shimoda X70. It'll, everything in the video will be linked down below and I also have it on my gear page. But specifically, I will just say that this bag is too big for 95% of photographers. I would not recommend this particular bag. I'd probably recommend the X50 or the X35. But the reason I have such a large bag is because I have to make videos like this. So that means I'm carrying two bodies, one to film me and one to shoot on, plus possibly a drone. And now I even have the 100 to 500, which we'll get to. But the reason that this is on the cusp of not being recommended. Now again, if you have a lot of equipment, it's great. But this is slightly over regulation for checked bags on airlines. Now the regulation, I'm gonna say all this in Imperial units, American units, whatever. Um, so you'll have to do the conversions. But the limit is, I believe, 22 inches tall, 14 inches wide, and then nine inches in depth. This bag is exactly 23 inches high. What I mean by that is if you can see, right here there's a metal frame in the bag and that helps keep support when you are using your waistband down here to hold up the weight. But this is exactly 23 inches, which is one inch over regulation. Now the good news is this width or whatever is only 12 inches, which is two inches under regulation, and the depth is only nine inches, which is exactly regulation. Now, I have never had a problem getting this on an airplane and there's a few tricks you can use to always get this on a flight no matter what. The first one being, as you can tell, the frame here is the highest point of the bag. Unless you have a bunch of stuff stuffed up here in the rucksack, which is one of the benefits of this bag, is it is huge. 70 liters, and there is so much stuff you could put in here. We're completely off screen at the moment. The nice part is there's an easy to access compartment right here in the front, so I can just access what's in this top part really easily. But a lot of the times when I'm hikes or anything like that, if I'm going short distances, this is when I use the bag the most. But when I'm on hikes and stuff, this means that I can stuff snacks, I can stuff the jacket I might be wearing that I'm now too hot to wear, and it'll just keep expanding for those light items. And it's really important to be able to carry that stuff. Sometimes I even just throw my camera up here just so I have ease of access to it really quickly. But what's nice about this for travel, like on an airline, is that I actually put my laptop bag up here and it actually sits pretty nice. I put my extra hard drives in here, anything that I need to take on the airplane. The key here is that if you're getting it onto an airplane, just make sure this looks small. Maybe if you had a jacket stuffed in here, take out the jacket and put it back on when you're passing by the people that are typically checking and it'll just make your bag look smaller. Something else I do is these straps right here, I will actually tuck in behind my back when I'm walking up to those people just to make the bag look smaller. Now, I have had people ask me to check the size of this bag. I took a budget airline from, I believe somewhere in Europe, I wanna say it was from Norway, and they made me check this in those little size checkers. And the good news is, I didn't think it was going to fit, but it did. But what happens if it doesn't fit? And I have been on airlines, especially in the States, that these really tiny planes that only have like one seat on one side and two seats on the other, where the overhead compartments are actually too small to fit this bag or even a regulation sized check bag. What happens is on those airlines is you have to hand the bag over 
Like when you're coming down to step onto the plane, you have to hand your bag over to someone and they put it under the carriage of the airline. Never want that for your camera bag. And the nice part about this bag is everything that's camera related is in an insert in the back right here. So this whole section comes out. And we're actually gonna do that right now in a second once I'm done talking about the rest of the bag. So you're gonna notice there's a tripod on this side. A tripod fits on both sides actually, but I'm using my second tripod. So let's talk weight, because someone on my Discord asked me how I handle weight. The reality is I don't really worry about weight when I'm traveling on an airline, specifically because of the trick I'm about to show you. Also, I don't have the tripods in the bag when I'm traveling on a plane. These get checked and that saves me about nine pounds in the bag. But let's say I'm going on a walk or a hike. It's roughly 32 pounds before anything else. The bag is six pounds. My two tripods are roughly nine pounds. And then all my camera equipment is about 16 pounds. Now, I can lighten that load depending on the walk or the hike. But my, my biggest suggestion is if you're doing anything longer than just a couple miles, I use a whole different system. If I'm going on a real hike, I take a hiking bag with a camera insert and take way less gear. Maybe I'll only take one tripod, one camera, maybe two lenses, just my smallest lenses, and that's it. And that was the biggest suggestion is that if you're looking for a bag to really do some hiking in, just buy a hiking bag with a camera insert. Do not buy a photography bag. No photography bag you're gonna buy uh, is gonna be as comfortable as a hiking bag with a camera insert. Now, the beauty of this is I get a lot of stuff in here. So this serves my purposes most of the time. Like 95%, this is great. It just sits in my passenger seat of Ross. I can grab it if I wanna grab it, or it's just I have access to all my cameras and stuff like that right in the passenger seat. Both tripods go here. Obviously water and stuff can be here. We've got some pockets for like my phone or something up here. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff, little pockets and stuff going on in here. So if I'm on a plane and the overhead compartment is too small to physically fit this or a normal size check bag, the beauty is because of the way this works, this camera insert right here comes out fully. Boom. So all of my camera gear is in this. And then I also leave this little sleeve that goes around this. And what will happen is if I got on a plane that's too small, I will put or take out this camera unit and put it under my feet. That was technically my personal item. So this solves two issues. If you ever run into an airline that won't let you bring this on because it's too big, you just take this out and say, I'm going to carry this and this is on my back and they'll let you through. I've never had that issue. Typically, even though this looks a little oversized because it is, no one's ever stopped me even on budget airlines. And in case they do, you can do this, but I have gotten on planes that are actually too small to fit the bag, and then I just take this out and put it under my feet. So with that out of the way, I'm gonna move this, and we're gonna to get to the gear that's in this bag right now. All right, let's talk camera gear. The first thing I'm gonna point out is this insert is organized in this way, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit but there's a whole gap here missing, and that is because my R7 with the Sigma 18-35 f1.8 is filming me. That is where this sits typically. We'll talk about video gear secondly. First, we're gonna start with photo gear. And the other thing to mention is the depth of this particular insert. If you get the X50 or smaller in the Shimoda series, this insert is a little bit smaller. The beauty of this insert and you know being able to carry so much stuff is that both my cameras can actually sit ready to go with the lens on them uh, this way rather than sitting this way. So both cameras are ready to go right here and I can take them out with the lens on it. The only lens that won't fit is obviously the 100 to 500, but that depth is what is important there because it houses both cameras without having to take their lenses off. So let's start with the Canon R5. This is my main shooter. This is what I take the majority of my photos on. And this has been my workhorse for over three years. Now, the thing is about gear for me, if you follow this channel for a while, you already know this, but if you're just clicking on this out of curiosity, gear for me isn't really about megapixels or dynamic range or what the best sensor is. A lot of gear for me is more about the convenience of getting out of my way when I'm working. And when I made my video originally on the R5 here, comparing it to my old 5D Mark IV, I even said that the image quality on this really isn't a huge shift but the convenience factor of being able to film videos on this to combine my old C100 and my 5D Mark IV basically into one camera, plus 
being able to have things like this articulating screen, which to me is one of the best features shooting landscapes, uh, really brings in why this camera is so nice. But it really is an image quality. And that's gonna be a common theme throughout a lot of the gear that I'm gonna show you. Um, another huge benefit that I'll talk about at the end is charging over USB-C. Oh, we should talk about the lens that's on it. This is the RF 14 to 35, and I currently have a Maven filter attached to it. And we'll talk about filters in a little bit, but if you want more information on that, obviously I've done a whole video on all of those, and uh, everything again will be linked down below. But let's talk the lens. So I replaced my EF 16 to 35 F4 with this, mostly out of convenience. Now my image quality didn't really change, but my image stabilization got better which means that I can handhold long exposure shots at a little bit more accuracy. It also means that video quality is a little bit stronger because of that better IS. And overall, it's just a nicer, smaller lens because I don't have to have the adapter on here from the old EF lens. Now, my biggest gripe about this lens is that when you are using it at its widest angle, the 14 mil side, you can tell that when I go to about 20, it actually goes in and out. So it gives in and out twice to go through the range of 14 to 35. And the reason this is kind of annoying is that if I'm at 14 and I'm fiddling with something on the front, like let's say I'm trying to adjust the polarizer and I accidentally push the lens in a little bit, it changes my focal range, which can be kind of a big deal when I'm trying to keep the exact same shot. Let's say I'm trying to time blend or I just want to keep the same frame to maybe blend a sky with a foreground of different lighting. That's my biggest frustration with this lens and I really wish it would be solved by just having a little lock button. So if I put my, if I set my focal range and had a little lock switch, that would solve a lot of issues. I still think it's a great lens, but that has been one of my gripes with the lens. So that is the R5 14 to 35. Next we will do my next lens, which is the 70 to 200. I did a whole video on why I love this lens right here. Like I said, I've pretty much gone through most of the stuff in this bag in individual videos. I replaced my 7200 2.8 EF lens with this, and it is probably my favorite camera purchase I've ever made, and it has nothing to do with image quality or anything like that. It only has to do with the convenience factor of how small this lens is. I mean, literally, this lens is roughly the same size as this RF 14 to 35. And that means that when I put this lens on here, it still fits when I set it in the bag. Um, it's <laughs> half the weight of my old lens. And I shoot a lot of work on 70 to 200. And the reality is most of my photography that you have ever seen or can see on this channel is shot with just these two. Uh, a lot of my portfolio could literally be shot with just this camera and these two lenses. And also when I do longer hikes, when I take that camera insert in my hiking bag, it is this setup with some filters, and that's it. I really lessened the weight on longer hikes. So this is my base photo equipment. This is what I would take or recommend to anyone starting out. Now you're gonna notice I don't have a 35 to 70 range. I kinda get away with that by having the 18 to 35 on a crop sensor on the R7 if I want up to 55, or if I don't have that with me, I can shoot about 50 mil taking a very small pano with the 70 mil side of this lens. It hasn't been something that I've really missed, but I have been shooting a little bit more of that focal range on my R7. Now let's get to the last lens, but something I want to notice as I'm getting to it is kind of the organization in here. You're going to notice, let's move this drone battery out of the way, we'll get to that in a bit, that there's some stuff sitting here that's in bubble wrap. And the reason that is, is because like I said, there's so much depth here that I didn't want to waste this space um, above this lens, which we're getting to. But the only way to really do that is I don't really want other lenses banging around in here. so. Essentially, we'll get to this in a second because it's video related, but these two things sit on top of my 100 to 500, which is down here. Now, it doesn't take very long to take that stuff out of the way to get to this, so it's not a huge deal. So the 100 to 500, I got this when I went to Alaska, mostly to shoot wildlife. I've done two videos on it, but I'll link you to this one. My final thoughts talking about, is a super telephoto worth it for landscape photography? The reality is I would not recommend this lens for a landscape photographer especially when you're trying to keep a budget. Realistically, you can get away with these lenses and cameras or any camera realistically, but mostly just this focal range. I don't think anything past 250 is really that necessary. The reason I've kept it is I have taken some really nice portfolio images 
on this lens, it's also nice to have when I'm just driving on the road. It's the lens that I keep on my camera when I'm driving around and there's nice light just because I have such a wide focal range. But if I was trying to save weight, this is always the first lens to go. I still love having this lens. I mean, I like to be able to capture wildlife when it happens, like that time in Newfoundland with the Ospreys. And it's really nice to have. I get more use out of this for video than I probably do photos. And all around, it's a great lens. It's about the size of my old 70 to 200. So if you can imagine, this lens is the size of this old lens, basically. But that is the crux of the photo gear. We'll talk accessories really quick. Here is the Maven filters. I've talked about these plenty. I don't really need to talk about them anymore. Like I said, videos on them. This is the holder for them. I keep a three stop, six stop, and 10 stop in polarizer. Realistically, I really only use the polarizer three stop and six stop. It's super rare if I ever use the 10 stop. And even using the six stop is mostly for video anyways. So photo equipment. This is the core of my photography. Now let's get into video stuff, filming these videos, making the vlogs. We're going to first start talking about the R7, which is what I'm filming on right now. And I did a whole video on me getting it right here. The reality is I actually downgraded from an X-T4. The video quality on the X-T4 was more pleasing and I think better than the R7. But I downgraded by selling that and buying the R7 when it came out, specifically out of convenience. First of all, it meant that I can use all of my lenses that are on my R5 for my R7, rather than I only having the one lens by Fuji for my X-T4. That's been a big deal. Um, when I'm shooting photos even, I actually switch to using the 100 to 500 on the R7 when I'm shooting wildlife specifically because that gives me 160 to 800 mil on that crop sensor, but it keeps the crop at like 33 megapixels because that's what the R7 is rated for. It's been really nice. And it also means that there's times where I could take photos on one camera and take photos on the other camera without having to switch lenses, which I could have done with the X-T4, but again, it just gives me the variability of using my whole lens kit here on the R7. Now, it is a downgrade image quality wise for video, but it was also a slight upgrade for me in convenience of menu systems and also batteries. The eye tracking right now is also far more reliable than the X-T4 was, and I can actually use it, which was on the X-T4, I couldn't rely on the eye autofocus. So because of those things, I downgraded the image quality to get reliability and convenience, and that is really what I tend to enjoy in my work. The other thing is I get to shoot on the 18 to 35 Sigma that's adapted on there, it's a 1.8 zoom lens. It's absolutely beautiful. It is like the perfect video lens outside of not having IS. Yes, it does work on the R5, but I get a little bit more detail on the native crop sensor on there. So I can switch those around if I need to, but it pretty much lives on the R7. So that is what I do talking head stuff with like you're listening to me right now. Let's get into a few of the other things that were sticking on top of that lens. The first thing in this bubble wrap is this little dead cat that actually typically sits on top of that camera, but I left it out so that it could be in the video. This is just a Deity D3. It's about a hundred dollar mic. It's great because I'm not worried about it getting hurt. I can just throw it around. Um, sounds great, does a great job. And right now I'm actually recording myself on an NTG3 with a Zoom H4, but that particular equipment for audio, I don't always have with me. That's not something I would include in this bag. That's more of my studio setup that I'm using right now but it is small enough to travel with. But the newest item I got that is super exciting, it's actually made me think about getting rid of my R7 for video is the new DJI Pocket 3. This thing is amazing. The image quality on this is so good that it feels like I don't really need to actually film any video on my R7 or my R5 unless I want something really cinematic looking or some slow-mo. But for vlogging, for all of that stuff, this thing has been absolutely amazing. And the beauty of it is it just makes my life more convenient because it has this wireless mic right here that you've seen on plenty of other YouTubers channels with the old pocket system. This makes it so much easier because I can actually just put this down here. It automatically connects to the pocket three. And that means that I just turn this on, turn this on, hit go and record. That means I don't have to worry about having either a microphone on top of my camera so I can be far away from the camera, or I don't have to have a separate system that I have to sync up later. The other beauty is I can use this microphone without the Pocket 3. So that means that if I'm filming on my phone for some reason, or I'm filming on one of these cameras, and I just wanna to record to right here, I can. So a lot of the times I'll just leave this attached to me in a day that I'm filming, 
and it does a fantastic job. I might actually do more in-depth stuff about this in a later video if you're interested, but for the most part, I think this is changing the game for me when it comes to vlogging. A lot of my old stuff was just using my phone just because it was convenient. Again, I could go out, take photos, focus on the photography, focus on making the videos, rather than focusing on the gear that's making the videos. Just turn this on, tell a story. That's the biggest thing. It makes it easier to tell a story and show you what it's like to be out there in the field. All right, so the last big thing in here is my Mavic 3 Pro, which I actually just got this month. Something I've been thinking about buying for over a year, and I'm gonna make a video on it, I think next week, so make sure to subscribe down below for that. I'll be talking about why it was so important to do it, and it has nothing really to do with image quality or video quality. Again, common theme throughout my stuff. So let's dive into that really quick. Some accessories is I have some ND polarizer filters for it. I think it's an 8, 16, 32, and 64 different NDs for mostly video related stuff. We have the RC controller here, which is both more convenient and less convenient than the Mavic 2 controller, mostly because it's slightly bigger than the Mavic 2 controller because I attached my phone to it, but it's more convenient in the sense that I don't have to worry about my phone or being logged into the DJI app to use my drone, which was a problem before. Uh, don't ask me how I know. Uh, it's nice having this controller, but I don't necessarily know it's a strict upgrade just because it does take up more space. Other thing in here, this is just an accessory pouch. We'll get to that in a little bit. That's not necessarily drone related, but I wanted to show you how it's packaged in here because you can't even actually see the drone currently. And like I said, it used to be where the drone was just top to bottom, but because this drone is just a little bit bigger, I had to get very creative. This little thing comes out and now my drone can be pulled out from here, right here. Typically when the drone is in there, this camera lens actually sits right above the drone, uh, nice and snug. And the thing is, it's not like I'm accessing my drone or need to pull it out immediately. I can move a few things around to grab it. But the thing is, it's just a little bit bigger than my old drone because of this giant camera bump on the Mavic 3 Pro. Now, like I said, I'm gonna do more talking about this particular drone later. The photos are great, the image is great, but the things that I really loved about this are the convenience. And this is a great time to mention specifically charging over USB-C. One of the hugest benefits of this drone over the Mavic 2 is that it just charges over USB-C. You might be asking, well, that, what's the big deal there? Two reasons. One, I live on the road, so being able to charge over to USB-C, DC to DC off of my battery, rather than having to convert DC to AC and go back to DC into this is a big deal. It's far more efficient. I have a USB-C plug on my battery and I can just charge the drone up rather than having to turn my AC sine wave inverter on to charge it. But more importantly is the reliability when I'm traveling on the road. Before I would check my drone charger and my check luggage, what happens either if I lost my drone charger in the check luggage or I got it and it died or it, something happened when I plugged it in, I would not be able to charge any of my drone batteries because it was proprietary to that drone. I couldn't just go somewhere and get a new charger. And that also applies to the R7 and the R5. Both of these cameras can charge over USB-C, which is a huge deal and it's why you don't see any camera charger in here for my camera batteries. Now, I still bring one with me just in case, but back in the day, I actually used to bring two because what happens if your charger dies when you're going on an expensive photo trip. Uh, you would just pretty much be screwed. There's no way to get a new charger. So all of this stuff, being able to charge over USB-C is a really big deal. It's far less worrisome when you're on the road. You can get a USB-C charger pretty much anywhere or I can use my laptop charger, anything. And that was one of the biggest upgrades of the Mavic 3 Pro, but most importantly was the battery life. And again, something I'll get to in that video that I'm gonna make. It almost doubled or tripled my battery life of my old Mavic 2. So last but not least, there's a few accessories left in here. There is a pack of ND filters right here that go on the Pocket 3. This is just to make my stuff look a little bit more cinematic so it's not locked in or it does lock into 1 50th of the second shutter speed. Next thing in here is this little black pouch. Now, I don't really use this anymore because I got the Mic 2 with the Osmo, but this is my old lavalier mic. And the beauty of this mic, it uses 32-bit float. And you're gonna notice there's no gain knobs or anything on this. That means that I just plug in my lav, plug this in, hit record, and then I do all of the audio editing post. It doesn't really clip or anything, and uh, it means that I can control the gain after the fact rather than having to worry about it in the field. Now, this was great for any windy conditions and stuff like that, but the inconvenience was that I always had to sync it with whatever camera I was filming on. Now that I have the Pocket 3 with the Mic 2, this is also 32-bit float, but it automatically connects to this, or my phone, and I can just sync it with my camera just like I would this, but there's no wires. And once again, Bluetooth over 
the Pocket 3. Way more convenient, but I'm still carrying this around as a fail-safe in case maybe this is the battery's dead on it or something's wrong with it or something like that. Still really nice, very cheap. It's only like 150 bucks. Honestly, it was great after I updated the firmware. It used to automatically shut off for some reason, but after updating the firmware, super reliable, great mic. I would highly recommend it for anyone looking for a 32-bit float, specifically lav recorder. Now the last things in here are an accessory for the Pocket 3, which is the little tripod extra battery accessory. This thing is super nice. I leave it in there, fits really well in that little pocket. And then I just have four extra batteries for my R7 or my R5. And again, that was a huge reason or really big convenience by getting rid of the X-T4 and going with the R7 is that all my batteries for those are interchangeable. So that means that I can use my R5 batteries with my R7, everything like that. And the last thing is this little accessory pouch. This is uh, just a travel pouch that you could buy at any REI travel store probably just get it at a Walmart even. This just keeps everything that would normally be loose and running around in a nice little bag. I've got some extra lens cloths in here that have not been opened. Those just sit in there. I got a ton of extra SD cards just sitting in here, some holders for them. I've got some batteries in here, some extra drone joysticks, just everything you could think of that would just be going around that's too small in this little pouch. Super convenient, can throw it anywhere. And the biggest thing is this is reusable for something else. So if this needed to be uh, you know, a battery or two or something, I can use this pouch for something else. Also, we didn't talk tripods. So let's talk tripods real quick. This is my, now it's Binro Globetrotter, but it used to be Mifoto Globetrotter. I have two tripods and one of them is more of a travel centric tripod. It's this one, this one's about 3.6, 3.8 pounds. And I've had this particular tripod for roughly six years but I've had this model of a tripod for roughly 12 years. I have one older version. And I love this tripod mostly just because the cost to performance ratio is really, really nice. Uh, the other tripod I have that's filming me right now is a slightly heavier, I think it's 5.5, maybe six pounds, carbon fiber Binro Mach 3. Like I said, everything will be linked down below. This one I normally only carry with me when I'm shooting from the car or only going on shorter walks, but I do pack both of them on maybe a two to four mile walk or hike but anytime I'm doing anything longer and I'm taking the you know very minimalized photo gear, I'm taking this travel tripod. The beauty of these two tripods is like I said, the cost to performance ratio. Most of the time I've bought these on sale. Actually, I just bought a replacement for this one once this one dies because uh, B&H was running a deal where this $350 tripod was only $180. I also got that one on sale for about $200. So the reason I do that, instead of buying like a really expensive, maybe $600 or $1,000 get so or really right stuff, is because I really throw these things around at this point. And the thing is, if I lost it or it broke or it got hurt in the ocean or something catastrophic, replacing it at only $200 is not a huge deal. Whereas if I broke one of those at $1,000, I'm going to feel it a lot more. So that means I can buy like five of these, six of these in the same time that I could buy one really right stuff or get so. And these last me easily five years at this point uh, or more. And it's just one of those things where for me, I just try to do the best cost to performance ratio. And my experience has been with these tripods. I would love to try some other tripods to see if the money is really worth it. But I can't imagine once you spend more than $350 on a tripod and a ball head for photography that it really gets all that much better. But those are the two tripods that I use. All right, so that is my gear for 2024. I do have a few other items that aren't included in this. I do have a 14 mil prime that I use to take Milky Way shots that I usually just check in my bag because it's such a cheap lens. I have a, quite a few pieces of video equipment that aren't mentioned in this, like my RE20 for doing voiceovers, my NTG3 and my Zoom that's recording me right now, plus some other stuff like a light and some teleprompter stuff. But the reality is all of this is what I use to make videos in the field or take photos. And if you're asking, do you need all this stuff? No, absolutely not. You can get away with just a camera, a lens, Get a microphone and shoot on your phone and you can make 90% of the videos that you see online. Realistically, it's just about telling a story, about telling, about being out there, showing the environment that you're in. Obviously, there's more creative ways to do it by adding like a drone, maybe a, a zoom lens to get some wildlife. You know, things like this are going to add some value to what you're creating. But don't get stuck in all of the gear talk. I don't usually focus on gear, but it is currently a frozen hellscape here in Canada and I thought this would be a fun video to do. So I hope you've enjoyed. If you have any questions or you want more info on something, make sure to ask down below or maybe on something that I haven't done a video for, I'll do based off your recommendations. Anyways, as always, thanks for watching. You can like the video if you liked it. Consider subscribing if you loved it. And I hope you uh, find some rainbows out there 
They gotta be out there. We just gotta go find them. Later. Alright. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you're... Welcome back, everyone. I hope you're... <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Thanks for coming. I'm Alex, and I talk about photography. And today, we're gonna talk about what's in my camera bag. We got it. Here we go. <laughs> Audio synced. Oh, that's definitely going in. <laughs> Everything you do on camera could be used to be roll cuts or bloopers. <laughs>